So, Cola, you have announced that your entire range, I think, of mission critical diesel generators are now compatible with hydro treated vegetable oil or HVO. So, um, what what um, what was the journey, if you like? How, how did how does this come about? Yeah, so so it really comes down, Phil, to the fuel and the engine compatibility, and so we don't create or manufacture the fuel. The fuel has been uh, developed. And, and so we've gone back and looked at all of our engine partners, our diesel engine partners, to ensure that the engines are certified to run on the HVO, um, which they are. And then once we've identified that, then we've undergone a lot of internal testings on the gen sets themselves to make sure that the performance and the standards and the environmental gains that were, that were uh, saying exists do exist. And so we've made sure that, you know, you're not going to have any lack of performance or any um, serviceable issues with the gen sets on the engines. And so today, every engine that we use in our diesel gen sets is fully approved to operate with the HVO fuel um, at any percent blend, which I'm sure we can speak about uh, in, uh, in a moment. Um, on the large diesel side, we have our KD series engines, we have Mitsubishi MHI engines, both approved on the smaller scale, Volvo, John Deere, and our KDI Kohler engines as well are all approved. So I mean, the, the key with this um, is really to make sure that the fuel itself is um, meeting the appropriate standards, whether that be in Europe or the US, um, and, uh, and with all cases it is. So um, really from our standpoint, you know, making sure and validating that the fuel doesn't diminish any performance requirements with the gen set or the engine. Um, and then from there, what we're really trying to do is just grow the awareness of HVO. Um, you know, there's a lot of benefits to HVO. And as the, the demand continues to, to increase with that, the cost will come back down and it will be gains for everyone in the supply chain. Um, the beauty of it, the technology is available today. And so the more awareness that you and I can create to the market and we can assure that specifiers are asking for it, end users are demanding it, then we start to see the benefits. And just to clarify, I was going to ask later on, but it, it seems relevant now. This is both for your new engines and also for your existing um, engines. So are we are we I mean, excuse my ignorance, but did you have to, for those, the existing, did you have to carry out any kind of, your partners have to carry out any modifications or you would, as you say, literally the fuel's there, you've checked that it works in the diesels and as long as it does, that, that, that's the, that's it. Yeah, it's really, it's, it's being uh, coined a drop in fuel. So, you know, if your tank's half empty, you can top it off with HVO. Um, if it's 75% full, you can put the other 25% in with HVO. You can mix it to any blend. Um, you don't have to wait to run the fuel out. You can, uh, you can mix it at any ratio that, that you need to and still get the same levels of efficiency and performance um, as you would from that generator. Um, it really, just from, from our standpoint, it makes it a, a, very, a very perfect um, fuel for mission critical standby applications, you know, where the units themselves, typically their insurance policies, they sit, they very rarely run ideally, um, you know, so, so you can have the fuel sitting in there waiting to be utilized. And if you get into an outage where you have to run um, many hours, many days at a time, you know, you can run down your HBO. And if you don't have the supply on hand or the availability, you can top that off with regular traditional diesel um, in those applications. So it makes it a really good fuel, but completely um, mixable, compatible. And, and it goes back to that standard, um, this ASTM, uh, ASTM, I forget the, the number in the US, but, but the fuel standard um, in the US for traditional diesel as well as HVO, it's exactly the same. And so those standards match up, you can just mix the fuels together. In Europe, um, there is a, a slightly different um, fuel standard for HVO, but the products work exactly the same. Okay, and in terms of uh, how HVO compares to what we might call first generation biodiesels, I'd be interested, and also perhaps a, a slightly um, adjacent supplementary. I know with traditional um, fossil diesels, 
uh, you mentioned obviously that the fuel often sits there for quite a while until the generator gets fired up and then there can be issues if it's been sat there for too long. So just, I guess, what are the advantages in simple terms of HVO compared to both first gen um, biodiesel and um, tra traditional fossil diesel? Um, so uh, let me, I'll, I'll, I guess I'll start, I'll, I'll try to reference some of the differences in the fuels themselves. You know, if we just think about fuel on three different levels, you know, first there's the, the conventional or traditional diesel that we're all familiar with, pulled out of the ground, goes through a refining process, and that's what most people use today. That first generation of biodiesel, it's, it's also referred to at times as FAME, uh, which is a fatty acid methyl ester. And it's produced, it's a renewable resource. And so it is produced from renewable sources, but it uses methane to create the fuel. And so um, from a FAME biodiesel, it's not really great for generator usage. The fuel itself doesn't last that long. And then the HVO, which is what we're speaking of today, it's the next generation of alternative fuels. Um, and, and it uses, uh, I can't get into too much of the science on it, but there's, it infuses heat and hydrogen and pressure and creates this fuel um, resulting in 100% fame free biodegradable fuel that performs exactly like traditional diesel. Um, so there's a number of uh, associated advantages with it. Um, I would say the first is, is probably around the storage. Um, and, um, you know, with, with traditional diesel, with the first generation of of, uh, of biodiesel storage life's roughly six months, um, you know, approximately, unless you put that through some type of, of fuel polishing process. Um, the second would be the carbon neutral aspect of it. All of the HVO is produced and uh, from waste products, animal fats and frying oils and things that would typically be put into a landfill um, that's all repurposed and used to create the fuel. Um, so it's a, it's a good alternative to any diesel for this backup solution um, for a number of reasons. Um, you know, it's biodegradable, it's non-toxic. Um, in the event of a spill, it would, it would uh, you know, be much safer for the environment in any surrounding areas than a traditional diesel would be. We mentioned the, the, um, the drop-in aspect, again, making it a good, a good solution from that standpoint. And, uh, and the beauty of it is it's available today. Um, it's not readily available everywhere, which is what we're trying to, to drive and generate, but it is available today. Yeah, I was gonna ask about that because obviously um, uh, we're all aware of the uh, somewhat um, high prices, fuel prices at the, cu at the current time. So does HVOA have any, you know, what's the, the sort of price comparison, but also to your point, you know, availability if, if the whole world which I'll clearly won't happen, but you know, switch overnight almost to HVO. I, I imagine there is some kind of capacity limitation at the moment, and, and what, but what is the the potential? I suppose. Yeah. So, so I think the the cost differentiator really depends on on where you're located in the world and how available the supply is. You know, Europe's far ahead of the U.S. and at the moment, um, I, I would say the range is anywhere from. 25% to 100% more, again, just depending on where you are and the availability, um, you know, but, but again, as more end users adapt to the fuel and start to demand it, obviously that's going to force the manufacturers of the fuel to, to continue to make their supply chain more robust, to, to find more um, better production. And then as the demand increases, so will the supply and then obviously the cost will come down. Yeah, I mean, what do you, clearly this is a bit of a, a sort of guessing game, but what would you imagine or like to see as, as the, the uptake? Do, do you think this is a real game changer that, you know, will get serious traction around these kind of applications? Or do you, do you think it will be one in a number of steps until we arrive at some kind of, you know, almost mythical, um, you know, biofuel that, that will, um, you know, be, be the, the replacement for, for fossil fuels? Um, I, I think it's a game changer. Uh, you know, I, I, um, as more people are aware, so, so everyone in the data center industry, everyone in basically any business, they, they typically have 
corporate social responsibility goals. They're all looking for ways to improve their carbon footprint. And in a standby application, you know, even at 25 up to 100 percent, in a standby application, the dollars are not that impactful. Um, and so if we can continue to drive more usage of this, it, it, there's benefit across the entire ecosystem. So I do think it's going to continue to, to gain traction as more and more people are aware of it. And again, as they start to, to demand it, because it, from a dollars and cents standpoint, um, you know, for units that typically just run on testing and every once in a while a short power outage, you know, the fuel consumption itself is not really a, a limiting factor. It's just the supply and it's up to us to continue to drive that and to educate the markets and the end users and the specifiers um, of the availability so they can start to require more and re or request it. But if everyone were to switch their standby generators over, it would uh, it would certainly uh, be a game changer for all of us with a, with up to about a 90 percent reduction in carbon footprint. It would be a big game, game changer for us. Okay, and in terms of um, Cola, the company, uh, this initiative, I I'm, imagine, might be one of, of, of many. You mentioned data centers and sustainability you know, is, is big on the agenda. So um, are you able to tell us some of the other, you know, some of the other things that you are um, either, you know, have already completed? Um, both, I guess, sorry, it's a multi-part question. So both sort of internally and for customers, and then anything that you're you know, currently looking looking at you know, carrying out as well, if that, if that makes sense. Uh, yeah, so internally at Kohler, um, you know, we're, we're very committed to reducing our carbon footprint. You know, our CEO several years ago, um, you know, very openly set a net zero greenhouse gas emissions um, objective by 2035. And we continue to strive towards that. Um, he's, he's, he and all of us here at Kohler were very aware, you know, of the, the climate crisis and, and the societal impact that that can have if not properly managed by everyone. So we're very driven by that. Um, we have a, 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 an internal social impact, sustainability uh, philosophy. It's under the umbrella of believing in better. And uh, it's on our website and there's a lot of information of all of the different various things that we're doing there. But it's really believing that whatever we're doing today, that we can do better, um, better for our planet, better for our customers, better for our business, better for the communities in which we, we work and, and reside. And, and so we're continuing to drive towards that. Um, we are exploring and investing in a number of different alternative clean energy platforms internally, um, you know, some of which I can speak to, some of which I can't. Um, just last year, we did invest in two new companies, um, acquisitions for Kohler Company at the end of last year. One was Curtis, Curtis Instruments and the other was Hala Technologies. Um, Curtis, um, was a is a leading supplier for electrical vehicles and different hybrid applications. They're they're in turf, they're in construction, they're in material handlings, lifts, ATVs, a number of different mobility applications driving um, EV. And so we're trying to leverage that technology internally um, to to help us. Um, continue to find ways to, to leverage that across different business platforms to, to drive uh, EV and reduction. And then Hala is another company that we acquired. It's a, it's a tech company really specializing in the integration and operation of DERs, distributed energy resources. Um, they have a patented technology. They can integrate and optimize any, any um, alternative energy source, whether it be solar or batteries, even generators, uh, fuel cells, and, and they have the, the patented technology that allows all of these technologies to work together to, to create, you know, I'll say a self-managed microgrid on the, in an application. So um, that's a big opportunity for us to continue to leverage and learn from as well uh, by bringing that into the platform. Um, additionally, I would say, you know, how we're trying to help customers, we're, we're, we, we do a lot of educational um, activities internally at Kohler and we try to continue to, to drive awareness with the specifiers and with the end users that can have an impact. Um, 
last year we had a data center event. It was called Powering Down. Um, it was a green, green conference. We brought a number of executives in from across the data center industry to Kohler, Wisconsin. Um, and it was really a thought leadership and knowledge sharing um, opportunity for, all, for a number of executives. And we were really trying to drive common sustainability initiatives in the data center industry to figure out how we can work together as a whole to drive improvement and to drive change. Um, and we've had a lot of uh, success from that. And we're going to continue to do that again this year, as well as again in 2024, it's on the agenda. Um, we did a white paper recently, as another example, um, really talking about the reduction and the maintenance procedures for our Kohler gensets and how you know, just changing from a monthly to an annual uh, load testing, you know, just exercising the units, you can have up to an 80%, 82% reduction in the total pollutants that are emitted from that. Um, again, approved for Kohler gensets just to reduce that, that uh, testing cycle. And, uh, and then lastly, you know, just from a product development standpoint internally, we follow a, a methodology that's called DFE, Designed for the Environment. And uh, it's really a data-driven process. It helps us understand for all of the products that we're designing and, and bringing to market, you know, what is the full environmental impact of those products? And it really requires us and puts accountability on us to rethink the design concept, concepts and to reduce any global footprint opportunities that are available. So a lot of activity going on um, and we're trying to, to play our part in any way that we can. And, and just maybe, in, in, have you noticed that amongst your customers, customer base a, a significant change in attitude to this, the, the sustainability? I mean, I think a while back, it'd be fair to say there was a bit of greenwashing and, um, you know, sort of buying, you know, planting a load of trees to offset carbon footprint. And that was about as sophisticated as it got. And now we're seeing a, a new level of, of um, engagement in, in sustainability. Um, I, I say, are you noticing that from your customers? Yeah, most certainly. Um, you know, and that was one of the major topics at the executive conference that we had last year. You know, greenwashing no longer cuts it. You know, you can't just go go buy energy in a field somewhere and let that be your reduction uh, offset. So um, the customers are pushing it, and, and it's really you know the, the larger hyperscale type customers that have the strongest voice and the biggest audience and, and the most uh, power in this. The, the Googles, Amazon, Facebooks, et cetera, those type of customers as they continue to drive and demand uh, people like us to improve, it, it's driving um, alternative um, energy options. And it's also driving alternative solutions such as HBO that can have an immediate impact. So um, yeah, they're not, they're not greenwashing anymore. They're, they're very serious about it and they've set their corporate mantras and they've driven that out into the market and to all of the, the upstream suppliers that they rely on. Okay, well Charles, I mean, it's been great to chat to you. You've given us some, some fascinating insights into COLA and, and sustainability issues and obviously uh, HBO. So appreciate your time. Thank you very much. Oh, excellent. Thank you very much, Phil. Pleasure chatting with you.